Okay, so today um, I want to bracket the Thursday lecture. The Thursday lecture was maybe philosophy heavy and definition heavy. Like I said, it was the most important thing, but the importance really remains to be um, demonstrated. But take my word for it, that was the biggest lecture. Um, but what I want to do is um, first review where we got, and then we're going to go through a bunch of examples. So what I call epsilon machine reconstruction. How do you go from the specification of a process, specification of the word distribution, to discovering what the hidden states and transition structure is? Right? That's what we did with the prediction game. Right? But we all did it intuitively. Today, I want to show you there's nothing intuitive about it. It's completely mechanistic. There's a way of going from the process specification, the word distribution, to finding the hidden states. In some sense, finding the intrinsic representation. So, so that's today might even be kind of a short lecture. Depends on how straightforward the examples are that I present. So, so by way of review, <coughs> right. So the endpoint was this thing I called the epsilon machine. So for historical purposes, they're called epsilon machines. It's a particular kind of hidden Markov model that are unifeeler. We know what that is. Um, but I have to convince you of that, because what we did on Thursday is I said, what we're really interested in is pr just prediction. And I went through a long series of uh, uh, constructions and steps in an argument that ended up with this thing here, this predictive or causal equivalence relation. Right? And it was motivated by, well, maybe I over-explained it on Thursday, but a really simple idea. We're trying to predict this process. And we make this assumption or ansatz that the effective states of the process are groups of histories, each one of which leads to the same prediction. Right? So in other words, we don't make distinctions between histories if, having seen them, they lead us to the same prediction. Right? Are you going to need more prediction? Yes. Uh, right. Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, that's a fair point. Um, it typically is. So, the right. Thing, so, but basically, the idea is your partition would be dependent on Right. Partition. Well, okay, so that, that, that was the way the Thursday lecture started out. I allowed us to make any assumption. All I'm interested in from the golden mean process is predicting the number of ones. So, that's a particular task I set myself, and that's obviously a subjective choice. And there are good and bad ways of doing that, and that was our, our sort of candidate scheme, R which, as soon as I state that, it, it induces effectively a partition of the space of histories. It groups them in certain ways. Okay. So what I have to still prove to you is that this predictive equivalence relation is sort of the way, with capital T-H-E, the way to do optimal prediction. Today we're going to do examples, so we get some idea of what the power and what the consequences are of assuming this relation. But then I have to come back Thursday, maybe next week, we're going to go through, and I have to prove to you that there was this resulting representation, the epsilon machine, is an optimal predictor. It's of minimal size, and lets us basically calculate everything we're interested in information theoretically, or, or even coming up with good prediction algorithms. So it's a pretty outrageous claim, namely that, that this thing, again, given the specification of the process, that's up to you. If you've got an experiment or a mathematical model, you have to come up with a word distribution. But once you give me that, the rest of this just follows. I apply this equivalence relation, and things happen. So I'll show you mechanically how things happen, how we discover the hidden states. But it all starts from here. <clears throat> but I have to prove these properties that I was arguing for on Thursday. That actually does prediction in an optimal sense. Last Thursday, my notion of prediction was pretty, was very general. All I wanted back were these future morphs, just distributions over the futures. Okay. So, in fact, that's how this is constructed, right? So I'll just state this again. So what we're doing is we have our space of histories, all these different histories, and we group into the same class two different histories when condition on those particular histories, S prime and S double prime, lowercase names, realization. So we've seen these two histories. We then do the best we can to predict the future. And when those distributions, future distributions, are the same, we say the process is in the same causal state. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but it really is just as simple as don't make distinctions between histories that are predictably effective. Why make a distinction? You can if you want. You'll end up with more partition elements in a larger model, but you don't have to do that. 
And then basically from this, basically everything is going to follow. But I will have to prove that to you with a series of, I think, constructive proofs. Okay, so this is the base here. And all the motivation last Thursday was to have this make some sense. But it's a pretty simple idea. Um, okay, so in terms of terminology, so if we start with the space of pasts, um, we basically go through there, however, and develop these, these future morphs, or I should say, the, the causal states. These are sets of pasts that are equivalent under this equivalence relation. And then they, we also have <clears throat> this series of um, future morphs, given that I know what causal state I'm in, I have the, the distribution over all the future uh, sequences that could occur, right? And then we think of the, uh, <coughs> um, the causal states as these groups of histories. So that's one, a causal state has several things attached to it. One is it's just a set of histories. And different sets of histories lead to different predictions. Uh, there's the whole set, so we can write that compactly as sort of the original space we're starting with. And then in sort of algebraic notation, we sort of mod out by this equivalence relation. And the resulting uh, set is a set of these states, or set of sets of histories. Okay. Um, there's another way to describe the induced partition over the space of pasts. That's with this epsilon map, and that's just a simple lookup function. When I plug in a particular history, it returns the set or causal state, or if you like, the name, state 7. Okay, so we have a functional representation of this. Um, um, and then, of course, like I said, attached to each state is some view of the future. Yeah? Um, is there a reason why down below you have the L at the top? Oh, uh, I mean, are we going to get into when you're considering like finite links and when you're considering like Yes, that? yeah. In fact, I'll kind of do that today with the examples. Um, here, I was just grabbing things to make a summary slide, so maybe it was a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly do practically see that today when we do this uh, reconstruction process. Okay. So then we went from to the raw set of histories, group them together so they're predictably, predictably equivalent, and then the set of morphs attached to each state or the set of prediction, different predictions we make. Once we had those states, we can then go through and look at if I'm in state seven and I see a one. What's the problem I go to state 12? I can go through that. I call that causal state filtering. If I had a series of measurements, at each moment in time I can stop and I've seen some history. I apply the epsilon function that says, oh, you're in, step, you're in state 7, seeing something else. I have a new history. Oh, you're in state 12 and so on. So I end up going from a raw data string, applying the epsilon function to this causal filtering. Then I have a process over causal states now and I can figure out what the transition probability is between those states. Okay, so, so that's the, again, the epsilon issue. Set of states and some set of transitions. So it's a kind of Markov, hidden Markov model. Right, we have measurement alphabet and then these set of states. They're different things and then this transition structure over. And I have to tell you what the properties are of this. For example, we have to prove that this model, this particular induced, equivalence relation induced model actually is unifelar. That's not obvious. In fact, it kind of becomes an interesting problem to deal with when you're doing actual reconstruction estimation. Um, there's a unique start state. The way you think about that is I haven't made any measurements yet. Um, formally, it's the equivalence relation. Remember, equivalence relation, you square brackets. Um, basically means we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, or the other way you can think about it is that the start state corresponds to starting with all the probability in this state here. Um, and uh, this example we'll come back to it again. It's actually the even process, 1, 1, any number of zeros, 1, 1. Um, we have recurrent states that are induced. You rattle around here for a while, but as soon as you transition out of that set, you never go back. And then there will be a recurrent component where we asymptotic a long time. We just keep rattling around in here. So transient and recurrent states get induced by the equivalence relation. <clears throat> so we think of them in terms of states. So four calls the states here. All the edges are labeled the symbol and a transition probability. Okay, we're calculating all that from the word distribution. Number of states, which transitions there are, how they're labeled, and what the transition probabilities are. That's all calculated from the word distribution. So I'll show you how to do that in 
various occasions. Okay, so that was the end result. Again, I have to tell you, <laughs> prove to you various properties about that. But let's first just think about, and this is a little bit, uh, doing some examples helps us think about what this predictive equivalence relation means. Also, what kinds of properties we're learning. So, <clears throat> so I call um, any process that goes from, any, I should say, say, procedure that goes from a specification of the word distribution or process to an epsilon machine by applying the equivalence relation. I call that reconstruction. A lot of times that's analytical. So we'll maybe go through some examples from statistics mechanics, various kinds of spin systems. You write down a Hamiltonian, describes the interaction between the spins. Uh, then you can derive how many causal states there are. You can look at systems going through phase transitions, talking about critical exponents and all that if you're familiar with statistical physics. Critical phenomena, so there's an analytical approach to that. I still call it reconstruction, but it's analytical calculation of the causal states and transition structure. Or you can think of this, and this is maybe the vocabulary I use the most, although half the examples would be analytical, as if talk about it as if it was some sort of finite sample like get the machine out. We'll talk about finite sample fluctuations. Uh, today, we're going to assume we have the exact description of the word distribution. So it's up to you to come up with the word distribution, and then we turn the crank. Okay. And there are a number of different algorithms at this point, different ways of implementing the estimation of the causal states and transition structure. Um, on the one hand, Thursday was the mathematical theory behind this. Next Thursday and next Tuesday will be more proofs in the mathematical case where we're assuming exact word distributions, exact description of the process. And then whenever you look at real data, finite sample, with noise, and all these other limit, limiting properties, different algorithms, different implementations of mathematical ideas have different forms and make different assumptions about the, the data and the source. We'll, we'll talk about that. Today I'm going to give you kind of a cartoon version of what's called subtree reconstruction, or I could almost call it morph reconstruction. Subtree here is sort of tree of futures here. Um, you can, these methods apply to both temporal data and also space-time data. So uh, you know, there's a quest. We'll, we'll go back to the cellular automata case and apply, modify the, the, the causal equivalence relation to apply to space and time data to patches in space-time. Not just time where we have histories, but space-time where we have light cones of dependence. Let will show you how to extend that. Um, Causal state splitting, well, how to say this? Subtree reconstruction, it's like every data point is a possible state that I group things together. Sometimes you call it subtree merging. There's, a, there's the opposite one, another algorithm called causal state splitting reconstruction, where you assume the data coming to you is an IID process, has no memory. And as you look at more data, you look for kind of statistical justification for adding more states, inferring more causal states. So we split states. Here we, every data point starts out, every word starts out as a separate state and we merge. So high complexity model gets smaller and smaller in subtree merging. Causal state splitting starts with a, a single bias coin multinomial process and splits and builds from below. The model gets more complex. So empirically these kind of bracket the truth. It should converge in, in, in machine. Model size from above and from below to the truth. Spectral reconstruction, this is just a different kind of thing. We've been using this to, uh, it goes from a power spectrum, so a frequency spectrum, to an epsilon machine. We've been using this to study uh, the structure of complex materials using diffraction spectra, X-ray diffraction spectra. Um, there's another approach uh, we call the optimal causal inference. It's related to this method called the bottleneck. This is more related to what Chan introduced called the rate distortion theory. That's a nice way of looking at how model complexity trades off against desired approximation level. I might have a thousand state model, but I don't want to work with that. I, I'm willing to give up 5% prediction error. If the result is five states, that's a huge win. So that's called optimal causal inference. Again, applies to time or space-time data. And then more recently, we're working on something called enumerative Bayesian inference. This is sort of the, sort of the most uh, straightforward. We have a way of going through and exactly enumerating all of the epsilon machines up to some number. But right now, the current thing is kind of an algorithmic challenge. We're up to uh, uh, eight, eight causal states, 
something like 44 billion of them. We actually ran a machine and calculated all these things. And the Bayesian method will have maybe Chris Slolaya from my postdoc come and talk about Bayes inference generally, but also how you can apply that to figure out from a given sample which of these candidate machines in this library, this enumerated library, is the best fit. It's just very direct application of what's called Bayesian inference. Anyway, point here is many, many, many different ways of doing this. And we can pick some of these later on to talk about <coughs> as time allows. Um, but now I, I just want to give you a, a, a flavor of this using the subtree merging approach. So what I'll do is go over the steps and then uh, we'll, we'll go through some examples explicitly. <coughs> okay, so we're going to start with the word distribution. So this is the input to subtree merging reconstruction. You have to give me this and it has to be accurate. Okay, we're going to assume that. So what we're going to do is form something called a parse tree. It's basically all the words of length D on a tree. Now we use that data structure to form estimates of or approximations of the future morphs conditioned on different pasts. Um, once we figure out the number of distinct future morphs, those are going to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the calls and states. We actually go back and look at which, uh, in this parse tree, which nodes made different predictions, basically name them, we can then get the state-to-state -state transitions from that, <coughs> and, and then we're done. So number of distinct, statistically distinct morphs, that gives us the causal states, and then we can go back and get the state-to-state -state transition structure from the tree. In this particular um, algorithm, we have three parameters, like all algorithms. Like I, there's another one, of course, which should, should just be how long, how long uh, the data sample is. But I'm assuming you're going to give me the uh, exact uh, word distribution. So we have D, the depth of this parse tree, the number of steps we're looking into the future, and the number of steps we're conditioning on in the past. So three, three parameters. Okay, so how does this work? So again, you should think in your mind what we're trying to do. The basis is just a direct implementation of the causal equivalence relation. Right? We were comparing future morphs, so we have to make some choice about how we're going to do that comparison over what length of futures and pasts. Okay, so here's an example. So if I had M sample or string of length M like this, um, what I'm going to do is uh, first lay out, since it's a binary alphabet, I lay out a binary tree to some depth. In this case, I'm choosing D equal 5, so that's a parameter. Um, of course, and then, and then I'm going to look at all the words of length 5 here. So I have number of instances of that in the data sample will look like them is m minus d. <coughs> m tends to be large, so this difference. And then uh, in this particular way of doing the reconstruction, the history lengths we're going to use are either 0, 1, 2, or 3, basically any, any possible length. So, so we put down our, our tree here. The top tree node is the start node. We'll see what that means in just a second. And what we're going to do is just go through, we have our window of, of d equal 5, and we're just going to sweep that through, and then for the length 5 words we see, we just put in a path. We just label the path. There's some path. If we don't see a particular word, then we're going to basically take that path out. So if I see 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, I put in 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Move one step forward, I have a new length 5 word. Put that in, starting at the top tree node. Okay, so here, one zero one zero one, one zero one zero one. Zero one zero one one, zero one zero one one. So that was similar to a previous word except the last symbol. That last little leaf was added. <clears throat> and then as we're doing this, the number of times we visit each node, even the start node, we just, there's a little counter sitting there. Every time we hit the note, we increment it. And what we're doing, in a sense, is just keeping track of the number of words that lead to a given note. So if this says 13 after I'm done here, that means I've seen the word zero 13 times. Just that simple. All we're doing here is giving, call it like a, a tree or hierarchical representation of the word distribution. This is the, the words of length one, zero one. 
the words of length two and their counts are down here, right? Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, and so on. Words of length three, words of length four. That's all we're doing. So nothing is, is very straightforward. But I hope you're thinking, I can code that up. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, if we have lots of data, feeling confident, then we can also estimate the probability of the word zero, zero by just taking the node count and dividing it by the total number of samples we have. That's our empirical frequentist estimate of each word. We can replace the counts with their probabilities. So again, I'm assuming we have the exact word distribution, so I can do that directly. But you can kind of see here, if you actually were to do this step by step and you had a finite data, then there'll be some issue about how good an estimation of the word is, the probability of the word is. I'm going to assume we have that exactly. So that's just easy to work with. So here, now the first step, we've gone from process, description, the word distribution, and now we have this hierarchical picture of the word distribution, where each node, in a sense, is associated with the probability of the word that leads to that node. So the probability of 0, 1, in that example, is we have this path, the word 0, 1 leads to here, and I store the probability there. Right, and that's, in, in other words, each, each one of these nodes is just some marginal distribution of this length D word distribution. Okay, so we just build that up. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, so that's uh, the first step. Then the second step is we actually want to figure out what the conditional transition probability is between nodes on the tree. In other words, if I see word W, well, I have that probability. I just look up W, oh, I have that probability. And then I see a new symbol. Now I have a new word. So I see W, and I see a new symbol, and that takes me to a new tree node. What I'm interested in, what's the relative probability? If I'm in node N, what's the probability of going to node N prime and seeing S? So I'm taking these absolute word probabilities in this tree structure and recalculating them to be sort of local transitions local transition probabilities on the tree, right? So what I'm interested in is the probability of going from n to n prime. Um, that's basically just uh, this ratio, the word probabilities here, right? the words that go to n prime and n. Or the other way to think about it, since w prime is ws, seen w, then cs, this ratio is just the conditional probability of probably seeing a 0, 1 given the, uh, the word, a history word. So I've seen some word, probably said one, seen zero. Okay, so that's how we calculate that from the previous tree. Just simple. Before we had probability of W, probability of uh, W prime, and we're just taking the ratio of those probabilities. And that and then is a node condition transition probability. So if you go through and do that, so now what I've done is, and this is just an example, we go through something like this, uh, just a bit, but just to show you what the next step is. So now what I'm going to do is I've gone through and changed the absolute word probability tree into a tree that is just labeled with these node-to-node -node transition probabilities. I've just gone through and calculated the, the ratio, word here, word here, and so on, all the way down. So every link between two nodes is now a symbol, 0, 1, and the probability of seeing them. And I just kind of filled in the numbers just to illustrate the next step is to find subtrees. So what I'm going to do is just look at paths of length one and future morphs of length two. In other words, I'm going two steps ahead. So I'm trying to find all the future conditional distributions over the next two symbols given I've seen one in the past. Okay. So here's one example calculation that's highlighted here in the red. In green, red is the history, so I'm going to ask, what's the probability of the next uh, two symbols, right, there are four of those, I can see 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, given that I saw a 0, specific. So, and then on the tree, the point here is to think about this, what this looks like on the tree. I've seen this one, so I'm in this tree node, and then I want to, given that, I want to calculate the probability of seeing 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Well, how do I do that? It's pretty simple. Given that I'm here, the probability of seeing 0, 0 is just the product of those two transition probabilities, four ninths. So given that I saw a 0, 
my prediction I'm going to see 0, 0 is 4, four ninths, or 0, 1 would be uh, 2 ninths, and so on. So I just kind of wrote, wrote these out here. So given this, given this, uh, uh, this, is, this is one of the morphs, right? Conditioned on a past of length one that gives me a certain view of what's going to happen in the future two steps ahead. So these are the morphs. Okay, so, so the, the intermediate punchline is that we were thinking, oh, I want to do these future distributions. Those are just subtrees. Somewhere on this big parse tree, we're trying to find all the dis probabilistically distinct subtrees calculated this way. Yeah? So is, is it necessarily true that L plus K is less than U? Um, uh, well, okay, the problem is you'll bottom out down here, right? Right. right. So, yeah, so there are some trade offs. There are constraints. In fact, I said before, these, we have these, these three parameters for subtree merging reconstruction. In fact, they're, they're related to each other. And, and exactly how you do that in the, the sort of finite case, uh, there's a little more work to do, which maybe we'll have some time to talk about. But here, I just want you to think graphically. I, I, I've done this, this move from what seemed to be this very formal equivalence relation definition to being very concrete. We're just looking at subtrees. And it's just simple transformations of the original word distribution into these transition, node to node transition probabilities. And we just go calculate all these. And I made the assumption, just to keep things simple, that we're just going two steps in the future and just looking on, on the past. Jim, yeah. If our data is not in binary, it's not zeros and ones, then you can use the same process. Yeah. The tree just looks radically bigger. Yes. Right. Right. So, so the branching here, if it was a five-letter alphabet, I'd have five lines coming up, A, B, C, D, E. Right. Which means these trees, if you think of this as a data structure, practical implementation, it gets a lot out of control. So, but that's fine. I'm understanding the challenges in my project better. Yes, good. Yes, I can do Ah, yes, as soon as they more alphabet, <laughs> larger alphabet. Um, again, so, so another case, let's look over here. I'm conditioning on the past of uh, length one. And then I look to see probably 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Those are slightly different numbers now. Okay, so we're calculating this morph. And if, if you look at this, so here is the future two steps ahead, and we have these probabilities attached to those four sequences. Notice that these four probabilities, the ones I get if I've seen a one, are different than these. In other words, the two morphs are different. This morph is different from this morph. They're different predictions, in the way I'm using the word prediction. OK. so so. Let's just kind of assume that we've done this and we realize that, oh, even if I condition on you know, a length two words, all I see are these two different morphs. Two steps ahead, I had to have these two different distributions. And then I would say that we have these two different morphs. So now I'm just thinking of just the, the, just the probability distribution over futures as some kind of signature for the predictions, and what I'm kind of assuming to get through this okay. quick tour is that that's all in the tree. Even if I had the original tree was depth 100, let's just assume that that's it. I went through, and these are the only depth two subtrees that I saw, the only two morphs that I saw, condition on histories of length. Zero, one, two, three, four, that's it. So that's it, first conclusion. This process, I made the word distribution from which I made the the tree, the parse tree, has two causal states. So I'm going from what their distributions are now, I'm just talking about their names at this point. Okay. Then what I can do is go back into the tree, and I go to each tree node, and I look two steps ahead and say, oh, is that morph A or B? And I put that name for the causal state up here. Because right? I haven't seen anything, that's the top tree node, I haven't seen anything. My prediction is that it looks like this, two steps ahead. Well, that's A, that's the subtree A. If I come down, if I've seen a zero, well, this is the example I gave you, <coughs> then hanging beneath it, there's a depth two tree, that's, um, that's the B morph. If I saw one, we have the A morph. If I saw one one, I have the A morph down here, and so on. I just go through and just relabel the tree nodes with 
the subtree name from morph hanging beneath it. Well, that's handy. Yeah. So, does it, does it just work out that way? The top down Yes. Yes. Top? Yes. In this example, we're going to go through all the different cases, okay. all the base cases shortly. In fact, I maybe come. I will over explain it, make it over explicit. But I'm trying to make it rather than seem abstract. It's completely mechanical at this point. I'm telling you all the little stages. I mean, these slides are explicit enough. You could at least go, in principle, after lecture, just go code it up if you wanted to, right? So, okay. So, so now I have this kind of relabeled parse tree. I have the calls of states. I just put their names up there. What are the state to state transitions? I just read them off. Right? A goes to A on a one with probability half. A goes to B on symbol zero with probability half, and so on. Okay, so that's the net result as we end up in these two states, and then the transition structure. So A goes to A on symbol 1 with a half. I just fill in the transitions. A goes to B on symbol 0 with half. B goes to itself on symbol 0 with 2 thirds. And then D goes back to A on probably 1 third and generates a 1. OK. So, so that's just real quick. I made a bunch of assumptions. Didn't really start with a given data string. But I wanted to lay out the steps. So when we go through the particular examples, they're kind of clear. So again, it's just given the correct word distribution. You build a parse tree, calculate these node to node relative transition probabilities, calculate these morphs. They're easy to see now, they're just the distinct subtrees. Those are synonymous with uh, the number of causal states. Go relabel the tree, and I can get the state to state transition structure. Result epsilon machine. Okay, I'm making a number of assumptions so that works. The most important of which is actually that. The word distribution is, is correct. OK, <clears throat> so the rest of the lecture, I just want to work through these. Part of that is to get back to the prediction game we played intuitively and show you that there's no intuition involved in this. Um, in fact, remember the period two case? That was a little bit bizarre. It was a little bit surprising. So why? Well, we'll explain that. And then you know some of our sort of favorite process generators. Well, imagine that we have the word distribution for the golden mean and show that, in fact, the generator we're familiar with, that we assumed, actually is entailed from that same thing for the even process. Although what I'm going to do here is just what I do, what I call topological reconstruction, not do the probabilities. And then the homework assigned today, due next week, as you go through the probabilistic calculation of the morphs. And some interesting things that happen on that. OK, so back to period one. Right? This is the boring example. Right? Yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, you can. I can imagine, like when I'm feeling particularly cranky or something, uh, processes where every different history leads to a different prediction of the future. Yes. Right. 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 So you'll see uh, uh, in the upcoming lectures when this sort of holds true, under what mathematical assumptions. So for example, we're going to assume stationarity, um, uh, sort of a finite memory property, then we'll end up with a finite number of causal states. There'll be other cases where we have an infinite number of, of uh, it's an infinite memory process with long range correlation. And what we'll see, that corresponds to a countable infinity of causal states. So in those cases in particular, as you look at longer and longer sequences, you get more and more states. You keep discovering new things. So, but th there's a way we can deal with that using this technique called renormalization group that uh, lets us sort of bootstrap up to infinite memory models from finite memory assumptions. Yeah. So here, today, just the simplest base case and you know, there are any number of ways this can fail. Finite data, the window's not big enough. I mean, right, the real exercise I give you like maybe we should just do this, give you a bunch of data, <laughs> and then I don't tell you anything. Well, I guess I kind of, there is a homework that does that. Uh, and then you have to discover for yourself what's going on, and then also come up with some narrative description of what the property is. Right? Typically, you don't know. Is this an infinite complexity process or not? I don't know. 
So there are these different ways we have of approaching that that we can now make systematic. Okay, but let's go deal with the simple cases and we can kind of dispatch them, uh, move on to more complicated, interesting things. Okay, so the period one process. So it's just all ones. So again, let's just step through. So I'm going to choose, I make a parse tree of depth five, which means I have this window of length five. And every time I see a word of length five, I build up the tree here. I put in a path that corresponds to that. So one, 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 one. Okay. Shift over here. Okay. Next word. Five ones. One, one, one. And so on. Right. So, so the parse tree is just this. <clears throat> in fact, I kind of jumped ahead and calculated the relative no to no transition probabilities, and probably did one. If I've seen nothing, I'm going to see a one. If I saw one, I'm going to see a one. If I saw one, one, I'm going to see one, one, and so on, right? So the space of histories of this process that I kind of drew as a set, it's actually just one point, all ones. OK, so now, how many morphs are there of depth two? Subtree shapes. One, right? So here, I look two steps ahead. I've got that. Okay, I'll put that over here. One, one. Come down here. Look ahead. Up oh, that same thing that I saw before. Same thing. So it's just one. So there's just one morph of depth two. Conclusion: There's one causal state. Okay. Call it A. So I go back and I label the tree with the A's, and A goes to A goes to A on symbol one with probability one. Okay, right. You can exactly write down what the future morphs are for all length, future lengths L, conditioned on basically any past, and then we end up with the epsilon machine. That's just one state. It is the start state. So that's the other thing I should tell you here is that whichever. Um, causal state is associated with the top tree node, that is the unique start state of the epsilon machine. And I denote that with the concentric circles. OK, so A goes A on symbol 1 with probability 1. Uh, we had <laughs> utterly trivial, <laughs> trivial one by one symbol labeled transition matrices. Right? There's sort of no uncertainty as to what state we're in. Uh, what's, what's the asymptotic distribution over the state? <laughs> One. Again, kind of trivial. Um, if you remember how we calculated for unifelar hidden Markov models, the entropy rate, well, okay, so I go to each state, well, in this case, state A with probability 1, and I look to the future, and what's my branching uncertainty? Zero. So the information version of that is that the entropy rate is zero for this. Statistical complexity. So last Thursday we talked about the size of model, but here we've got one state. And we apply p log p to the state distribution. Well, there is one event, A, that's completely certain. There's no information of that. So the statistical complexity is zero bits. OK. So this is you know, genuinely flogging a dead horse at this point, right? It's all ones. Even the first time we did the prediction game was obvious. But still, it's an important base case. And here's the other important base case. Remember the fair coin? So here, well, that was the previous sample, but you know, imagine I give a long enough sample, or I just tell you it's a fair coin. It's the uniform distribution over words any length. I build the parse tree of depth five, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here just because it should be kind of obvious what the node to node transition probability should be. From every tree node, I get 50, 50, 0, 1 generation. Okay, so I do that. And then the question is, how many probabilistic distinct morphs of depth two are there? One, exactly. So far, these are not difficult. Stay tuned. <laughs> right, there's one. There's one. Right, you just go here, you look down here, and you say, oh, actually, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. They're all, all four of their sequences have probability one, one quarter. I make the same conclusion down here. No matter what, I can, what history I condition on, I look, and it's making the same prediction that all length two sequences have the same probability. So there's just one morph. Again, call it A. Now, the space of histories is actually 
the set of all binary strings, semi-infinite binary strings. It's a huge space, right? But we can still write down exactly in closed form what the future morph is for any condition on any sequence going L steps into the future. It's always a uniform distribution over length of binary sequences. Okay, next step. So we've concluded there's just one morph. I go back to the tree and I label all the tree nodes that have that full binary tree of depth 2 hanging beneath it. Here, 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 everywhere, right? Okay, so then I can read off the transition points. A goes to A on a 0, probably a half. A goes to A, probably a half on a 1. A goes to A on a 1, probably a half, and so on. And so just like we concluded before, You have a single state A, and the transition structure is 0 with probability of half, 1 with probability of half. Now, when we talked about the prediction game on last Thursday, there was a little bit of debate. Maybe it should have been a two-state. Well, there's a two-state version of this. I could just call it A and A prime and label the previous tree in some way. But this is the minimal one. Again, what I meant by minimal was rather simple. I can't remove this, this, or anything, and have it still properly describe the process. And it still captures the fair coin. <clears throat> so um, we didn't have to assume minimality here. I mean, it, it, some of you have some familiar with machine learning, and there's a, in fact a lot of the the entire discipline is interested in sort of not overfitting and sort of complexity costs and minimizing choosing the smallest model. Basically, different algorithmic implementations of Occam's razor. Right? Don't multiply explanation beyond necessity. We didn't assume it. That fell out. That's we entailed by the. Wouldn't we most likely get something more complicated than this? Right? Yes, so absolutely. Sure. Right. And we'll talk about finite sample fluctuations, even for a fair coin. Yeah. Even for a fair coin. Especially. Yeah, it's almost maybe the most interesting case in a way. It's kind of the base case, yes. So we'll come back to that, yeah. Right. So, next lecture, or after that, I will prove that. The equivalence relation leads to minimal models. It's not obvious if I give you that, that it's minimal. Once I prove it to you, hopefully it will be obvious, but not right now. So I'm just pointing it out. In this case, I could have had you know, four states with equal branching 0, 1 from each state, and that would still generate a fair coin. But this picked out, because we're doing these equivalence classes, just one state it gave us the minimal model. So we get minimality for free, in a sense. It's not an additional assumption. Our, the only assumption we're making is trying to do prediction. What's interesting is trying to do prediction leads us to minimal models, minimal structures. OK, so states, well, the set of sequences associated with uh, the, the causal states are just all binary sequences, trivial, symbol labeled transition matrices, one by one matrices, each with probably half. Um, causal state distribution, we have only one state, so we're always there. And now notice, if we go to each state and look at the branching uncertainty to calculate the Shannon entropy rate, the source entropy rate, we have maximal uncertainty. However, we know the process is always in one state. That is not, don't tell me that. I know that. There's no surprise. Therefore, the statistical complexity is zero. Or let's say this log of one state is zero. So we're going to come back and talk about well, we talked a lot about degrees of randomness with the entropy rate, but we have to think a little more about what the statistical complexity means. Last Thursday, I said, well, think of it like model size, roughly. It's kind of the uniformity of the distribution over states. If you have one state, then it's just zero. It's actually related to the amount of memory in the process. But that's something else I have to prove to you. <laughs> so, uh, OK, now let's just tweak things a little bit. We didn't do this on Thursday in the prediction game. But we did do this, remember, way back when, when we first started talking about word distributions and sequences. We did the bias coin. Right? And that was peculiar because, A, well, it's a simple generator. And you can just imagine doing probably two-thirds for ones and one-third for zeros. And it ended up with that really complicated word distribution, that fractal probability amplitude word distribution. I'm just showing you all of the, the mosaic of the word distributions in a tree form here. Nothing different, just a different graphical representation. Okay, so our bias is two thirds. 
we go down, and again, I'm kind of jumping ahead uh, in how to fill out the tree. Uh, so we see zero will probably be a third, one will probably be two thirds, and so I calculate the relative transition probabilities, and then what I see is that basically the hanging, hanging beneath each tree node is the same subtree of depth two. It's the top tree node, or down here, you see the same thing. Zero, zero is always probably one ninth, and so on. So how many morphs are there? Just one of depth two. Hence, there's one causal state. Same big space of histories. All sequences occur. What's changed from the fair coin is just this complicated set of probability amplitudes attached to each sequence. We can write out exactly what the, the morph is conditioned on any history. We have this binomial distribution of futures. That's a nice closed form. So single state. We go back to the tree. We label each tree node with the subtree hanging beneath it. Well, that's all A's. Since we agreed on already. So that means we end up with a single state and then transition on one probability two thirds, transition on the zero probability one third. So simple one by one transition matrices, kind of trivial. Uh, this is a simple process. Again, asymptotic invariant. Distribution is just one. Now, the branching uncertainty is the binary entropy function of two thirds. That's the bias we see at, at, at the single state. But the statistical complexity is still zero. We're always in state A. There's no state information per se. Okay, so so this is slightly more predictable than the fair coin. The is less than one. Okay, so now for the puzzling case for the prediction game, the period two process. Right, so zero one zero one zero one. We <coughs> go through uh, look at the, the word of length five zero one zero one zero zero one zero one zero. Shift over here. I have a new word one zero one zero one one zero one zero one. Shift again zero one zero one zero zero one zero one zero. Okay, that repeats after that to depth five. Now this is the fun question: How many distinct morphs are there of depth two? Two. two. We have a vote for two. Three? That was kind of tentative. <laughs> Be bold. Right, right, exactly. Right. So here, depth two. Or if I'm here, I go, I, I, my, my knee goes this way. If I'm here, my knee goes that way. So in fact, there are three. Right, so this is explaining back when we did the. The, the, the prediction game, why I sort of insisted that there could be these other kinds of states. Now certainly, you know, once, once you sort of forget any initial part, that condition on history is sufficiently long, I'm only going to see futures like this. So this thing is, this particular morph, S0, the start state, top tree node, is how I'm figuring out what phase the period two sequence is in. I have to measure a zero or one first. Okay, so we can write out explicitly what the space of histories is. Well, it's basically just two points. You know, all the histories that end in a zero, well, the history that ends in a zero, and the history that ends in one. Um, I can just look at what sequences occur, conditioned on having seen nothing, top tree node. Well, I can see two uh, futures. If I see a zero, there's only one future I can see. If I see a one, there's only one future I can see. So I can write out this and then calculate the probabilities from the tree. So if I haven't seen anything yet, if I haven't done no measurement, zero or one looks like a fair coin. That's my prediction. I don't know what phase is it could be in either phase. However, if I've seen a zero, I know I'm going to see a one, and I'm not going to see a zero, and vice versa. If I saw a one as my past. I know I'm not going to see a 1, I'm going to see a 0. So I go back, label all the, the transition probabilities, and then I go uh, put the causal state names at the tree nodes that have the, the morph hanging beneath them. So I have S0 here, because it's this Bodhini thing. That's the only place it occurs. And then I have S2 here, and S1 here, S2 here, and S1 here. So all the way down. So we know that 
uh, S2 goes to S1 on the 1, S1 goes to S2 on the 0. However, S0 can go to either S2 or S1 on the 0, 1 fair probability. And then that was the answer I gave when we did the prediction game. If I know what the phase is, then I can predict exactly. But getting started before I made any measurement, I have to see, is it in the zero phase or is it the one phase? And then from that point forward. So if I hadn't made any measurements, my uncertainty is the highest. It's, it looks like a fair coin, zero, one equal probability. But as soon as I make a measurement, I can now start to predict, in fact, exa predict exactly. So that's one of the useful uh, things you extract from laying out all of the, the, the causal states, both transient and recurrent states. The transient states tell you how you come to do optimal prediction. I have to make a measurement first, and then from then on, the entropy rate's zero. My answer is zero. Well, you can write out, like I said before, the different histories that are associated with each state, uh, each of the three causal states. And now I have these three by three symbol labeled transition matrices. Sparse. Um, the causal state distribution now, asymptotically, all probability leaks out of here. I mean, I can imagine, if I haven't made a measurement, then I assume I'm in the start state. So then that splits out 50-50, and then that just rattles around. So this is my asymptotic state distribution. Start state zero probability, and then S1 and S2 have equal probability. The entropy rate is an asymptotic coordinate. So after I've seen an arbitrary long history, I mean, either S1 or S2, and I look to the future, and there's just one transition possible, so the entropy rate is zero. It's completely predictable. Now, for the first time in the series of examples, I have two states, and there's some information. I can tell you, oh, it's in the sort of even phase or the odd phase of its cycle, and that's informative to you if you don't know what state it's in. So we have two events, equally likely, so there's one bit of state information, one bit of statistical complexity. What does that information mean? It's the amount of information in the phase. Yeah? So what happens to the zero when you're doing the statistical the top state? I mean, I don't know how to phrase the question, but mm -hmm. like the, you're doing P log P. Right. Um, we're, we're doing P log P over this asymptotic state distribution. That's the way I defined it. Now you could say, now wait a second, I actually have me very interested for one of my applications and how I come to know what the asymptotic state distribution is. Or the other, the other question, how, if, if I start with all the problem up here, how does that actually relax onto the asymptotic state distribution? So that, that's a question about finite, the, the, the conditioning on finite length histories, like zero, even, and how that relaxes. So the, there, there, there should be some question in your mind about, well, that how does, maybe there's something about how the initial, there's all the probability up here and watching it flow down, that might be related to that transient information we were talking about when we looked at the block entropy and how that got to the asymptotic, asymptotic E plus H mu L, the, the linear asymptote. So, so, so the transient states become important for questions like that. These are just as, time asymptotic ones. For that. <coughs> but there's more structure here. In fact, if I just tell you H mu is zero and C mu is equal to one, yeah. This is much more informative, right? You, you now, I mean, it's kind of trivial, but there is, you know, and we pulled this out just mechanistically. We weren't guessing. You just turn the crank. It's a period two process. There's a certain way you synchronize to it. Imagine it was a period three process. You now, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. You can do the same thing. There'd be a cycle of three states with, actually, it turns out two transient states that tell you, as you're measuring zero, one, how you come to know which of the three phases processing of period seven. There's actually much more structural information here. The architecture of the machine is really telling you how the process is organized. Okay, so now um, mixtures of these and more interesting. So what I want to do is uh, talk about the golden mean process. So remember that's easy. That's Golden mean process generates all binary sequences except a zero can't follow a zero. That's the only restriction, right? That's the irreducible forbidden word, zero, zero. 
And what I'm going to sort of talk through here is uh, not probabilistic morphs, but we're just going to look at what sequences occur in the past and also in the future morphs. I call that topological reconstruction. I'm forgetting all of the, uh, the, the, the word probabilities, just looking at what words occur or which don't occur. And that just means we're putting in certain paths, or not sort of putting in certain paths in the parse tree yet. Oh, so zero, zero can't occur anywhere or only at the right. beginning? Anywhere. Yeah. Never can produce. Right. Okay. So I'll just kind of jump right ahead. I'm, again, I'm dropping all the, the probabilistic part of the argument just to get through it. Um, it's not hard. It's just to simplify because this is one of the homeworks to do the probabilistic reconstruction. Okay. So imagine uh, we try, try to, to argue why the golden mean process has this particular tree structure. Well, the only restriction is zero to zero. <clears throat> so I can see ones. I can see a 1 and a 0, but if I see a 0, I must see a 1. If I see a 0, I must see a 1. So you can kind of tell every time I've seen a 0 anywhere in the tree, I cut off, I prune that part of the tree. It's the same thing I pointed out when we were looking at mosaic of word distributions, how 0, 0 occurs at length 2, and then it actually has a cascading effect to all the longer length word distributions where there are subsets taken out and then sort of arguing in the limit infant sequence, that's actually a cantor set of sequences that, that are removed. So that's one way of looking at this on this tree. One restriction that has this infinite cascade of restrictions uh, further down in the tree for longer words that uh, are not allowed to contain zero, zero. Okay, so now the fun stuff. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to look at morphs of depth two. So how many distinct morphs are there? Three. Very fast. Good. Where are they? First one. Right. We always start at the top, right? So the top is a branch, maybe like a coin flip, and then a restriction here. And this part, zero and one. This one here? No, no it's that one. Zero and then one. Oh, this, this guy down. Okay, so this this one here, so yes. so I see a one, and then I, then I can see a, a coin flip. And then the first part is the zero and the top. This one here? No, no, uh, from the up zero. Here? And, yeah, zero. Zero. And one. One. Mm -hmm. So this guy. Yeah. Uh, isn't this guy the same as this guy? Mm -hmm. that takes me a while. <laughs> right, okay. There's at least this guy. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, and then if I look here, uh, uh, I have you know, this one, so that's the second one I haven't seen. If I look over here, well, that's branch and then a restriction. So, so this is the same as this guy up, up, up here. Um, sure, there are just two. Oh, yeah. Did I get this confused? I might have copied the wrong thing. Da da. Oh right. We have zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. Yeah, no, no, but I, but I'm actually, okay, I tried to dumb this down from the probabilistic version. Oh, the start right. state has different probabilities. Yeah. It does, actually, right. So I kind of jumped ahead here. So this is some bizarre mixture of <laughs> probabilistic reconstruction. So this is half the answer to the, the homework exercise. So, okay, right, right. So, so in fact, right. Uh, I should have written this out. So what happens if you put in the probabilities, then start top tree node, if I look just one step ahead, I'm basically just looking at the probability of single zero and the probability of single one. And that happens to be uh, two-thirds and one-third in this case. Whereas if I condition on seeing a one, then it turns out that this guy, which has the same shape as this upper one, Actually, it's 50-50 in this case. So I should go write that over. Which in that case, <laughs> if it's really probabilistic, you get three morphs. Where this is, again, this should be 50-50. I'm sorry, this should be two-thirds, one-third here. And it's different from B because this is 50-50 if you work out the node-to-node the, the -node transition properties, like I said you should. Obviously, C is just a different shape. 
where A and B would be probabilistically distinct. Yeah, well, interesting. Yeah, I should just drop that. It's, it's the probabilistic reconstruction. I should just not be lazy and put the transition probabilities on there. The net result, if you're doing, well, the probabilistic reconstruction is this. is what I just said. There are three. Then we have this, this the, the, the causal state that's associated with the top tree node. That first branching on 0, 1, 2 thirds, 1 third. And then uh, it was <coughs> it was B. Once we've seen the one, then going forward, B is a fair coin flip on the 0 and 1. And then since we saw a 0 leaving C, we have to see a 1 with probability 1 because no consecutive zeros. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Kind of jumped the gun on the topological reconstruction. Uh, right. So then you end up with with this. So so this is the answer to one of the homeworks. And what you're supposed to do is fill this out correctly. <laughs> what I should do is just have an A B with these two and then you will then see that there are actually three if you look at the probabilistically distinct future morphs. Right. Okay. Does it make sense to say, I mean, looking at this uh, model here, if you're not looking at probabilities, we'd say states A and B were equivalent. Yes. So it makes right. Sense that we... right. 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 And, and, then, and then the transition structure you get. No. Like that. And this would be the start state. And then it would just be yeah, zero. So you must see the one two. and the one state. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll go clean that up so it actually is the, the topological reconstruction. Right. But anyway, this, this is what you should get with your probabilistic reconstruction. So that's the hope the target is this for the homework. And then you have to calculate those morphs just like I was doing in the previous examples. And the node to node transition probabilities. So continuing on, now that I've got this you know, hidden Markov model, I can ask, what's the asymptotic state distribution? Well, it's two thirds, one third here. State A, transient state, purely transient state. After one step, I never see it again. Even. Um, so I end up with, uh, again, I go, I mean, state B would probably be two thirds. I see a fair branching. That's one bit of uncertainty, but that only happens two thirds of the time. So that's two thirds of a bit, but I'm in state C probably one third of the time, but there's no transition uncertainty because I'm definitely going to see a one. So the net result is that I have the entropy of a two thirds bit per time step. Right. Only two thirds of the time do I see a fair coin flip. Now, the statistical complexity is now this kind of mixture of things. It's, I have this distribution, so I'm not writing out the numbers, just the binary entropy function of two thirds, two events with bias two thirds. That's the, that's the, the state of information. Um, let's see if I get this topological reconstruction right. <laughs> okay, so the even process. Well, that's a little harder to describe. Maybe that means it's more complex. Um, so the even process generates all binary sequences, and when ones occur, they occur in blocks of even number bounded by zeros. And every time I see a pair of ones, the next zero or one occur with fair probability. So that's the kind of narrative description of the even process. Okay. So what I've done is I've just put into a depth five tree the words that occur, the probabilities. Um, and well, actually, you know, so it's a depth one, I see zeros or ones. To depth two, I see all length two words. To depth three, well, actually, there's only one forbidden word. That was a zero, an odd number of ones, and a zero. That's forbidden. In fact, what I should do, but it almost is impossible to describe. Remember, we don't see another forbidden word until we get down here. Zero, three ones, zero, one, 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 and a zero. That's forbidden. And at every odd length, there's a new irreducible forbidden word. Zero, odd number of ones, and a zero. So new restrictions are coming in. Each restriction at a shorter length has its own cascading pruning that it does for words that can 
contain it. Those are disallowed. Okay, so now this, again, you have to, <laughs> it takes a little more pondering. I'm pretty sure I got this topological reconstruction right. Okay, so to depth two, and there's a bit of an issue here, right? So now we're starting to see structure over longer futures. You might imagine, well, maybe a parse tree of depth six would be better. So there's a bit of a trade-off here. I'm kind of trying to guess these so I can put it on a graphic that we can actually see. Okay, so here's the parse tree again. So how many uh, depth two subtrees are there? Four. Four, we have four. Um, well, okay, let's go through. So the, the way I write the algorithm, I go to each thing, I look at the signature, store that off, see if I haven't seen it. If not, I put it in my list. Go to this one, do the same thing, just kind of go down. In this case, you're just looking for which words of like four occur. So here, top tree node, two steps ahead, we see all four binary sequences. Um, here, there's actually a restriction. I don't see one zero, so I put that aside, so that's three. Uh, come down here, well, that's this full binary tree of depth two. I saw that above, ignoring probabilities. Um, well, sometimes we ignore this part, but the one, some, uh, sometimes we just take account for this. I mean, we have, we have a start point as a different point right. sometimes, but sometimes... That was my know. mistake on the previous example. What I was showing you were the probabilistically distinct things. I was trying to set it up, so I was giving you minimal information, minimal helpful information for the exercise. I gave you too much. So I did half. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix that in the slides. So. Okay. The previous distinction was a probabilistic distinction. So the art is... A and B would have been the same yeah. if I was just looking at the topological, what sequences occurred in the future. Um, yeah. So here, I don't know, I, I kind of do a pattern matching. I mean, it gets a little tedious. Notice if I'm here... I must see one, and then I have a branch. That's a new one there. Eh, I don't know. You can kind of go. I mean, it's sort of exhaustive. <laughs> you kind of go through here, keep checking, keep checking, keep checking. Then there's a decision criteria. Well, in this case, I know I can stop because I define what process we're looking at. So the net result for topological reconstruction is that there are three. So, uh, there are various, yeah. If you know what this, the, the process is, there are ways of calculating how far you have to go ahead into the future and into the past to see all of the topologically distinct or probabilistic distinct causal states. Um, here, I'm just choosing the parameters so it works out. Uh, I mean, A is the same as when you don't have double, double circle. That's the start state here, start, yeah. start mm -hmm. tree node, yeah. yeah. Right. So when the um, That's true, I should, I should probably... We have another, another... It's probably a little confusing. I should probably not put the doubles. I mean, I'm doing that to remind myself that okay. not only does this occur further down in the tree, but it's also associated with the top tree node, which means it's a start it's the start causal state. So that, that's what I'm doing here. Yeah, I don't mean that this occurred elsewhere. It can't. This can only be at the top, but it also occurs elsewhere, like down here. Or down here. Okay, so now, I mean, at some point you start to realize why this is worth programming up. <laughs> you do enough examples, it gets a little bit kind of tedious, but there's still interesting things to do it by hand. But, uh, it is a procedure after all. Okay, so now we go back to the tree and label the tree nodes with their associated subtree hanging beneath them. Okay, so A here, start tree node, full binary tree, full binary tree, full binary tree. But if I see a zero, then I end up with this binary tree with this one missing for the odd length thing. And, and so on these down here, and then C is this C1 and then it can branch. So I've gone through and labeled all of that. In fact, I even labeled down here because I was actually looking at a depth six tree. So that's an example where I actually had to look at words a little bit longer to get this to work out. 
I mean, I, I, from just looking one step below this tree, I don't know that it's A. So I actually kind of worked it out, but I didn't display it because it's very busy. They shrink down. Okay. So, uh, so, so what, what does this tell us? Topologically, if A goes to A on a 1, A goes to A on a 1, A goes to A on a 1. A goes to B on a zero, B goes to B on a zero, and B goes to C on a one, C goes to B on a one, and so on. Uh, notice that most of the tree nodes are just Bs and Cs. The only place I see A tree nodes is on this far left when I'm seeing ones. And as soon as I step out of that, I fall back into B and C causal states. So this is kind of hinting that A is going to be a transient state that can map to itself. So we have the three causal states. Uh, can go through like I just did and make a list of what states are allowed on a zero, what state transitions are allowed on a one. Um, this is also kind of mixing things. So you end up with this three state picture, which I should Kind of jumping ahead. Ignore the transition probabilities for now. So basically, you end up with these three states. So here's A, the start state, goes to itself on a 1. As soon as I see a 0, I drop down to B. That was the only way of transiting out on the tree of that long series of 1s into the main part of the tree. And then from then on, what is this? Okay. Sorry. B goes to C on a 1, then I must see 1, and then B goes to itself on a 0. So now I'm putting in transition probabilities here as if it were a stochastic process. That, that's not really justified topologically. Sometimes what we do is if we just have a machine here without transition probabilities, right, we talk about the topological machine and we just, as a default assumption, assume that we have fair coin branching. If you want to calculate a property like the statistical complexity, you have, you have to put a transition probability on there. Kind of null assumption. Um, <clears throat> another way to do it would be to take even if this is the topological picture, it just describes what sequences are generated after probabilities. I can take a sequence generated by the, the actual uh, even process and run it through here and calculate empirically what these probabilities should be. That'd be some kind of approximation. Um, it turns out, and this is sort of the punchline that maybe makes this distinction between topological uh, reconstruction and, and epsilon machines and probabilistic uh, machines clear. For the even process, it turns out there are four causal states, four probabilistic distinct causal states. So the full probabilistic reconstruction shows, in fact, it, it's almost like that previous single state, transient state that looped to itself on a certain kind of splits. There's some modulation of the future probabilities that you have to keep track of. So I actually now have this this loop in the transient states, which means I can stay here as long as I keep seeing ones. Of course, the probability of that goes down exponentially fast, and eventually I see a zero leak into the two recurrent states. Like this. So, so that should look familiar. That this is the actual way we've been thinking about the even process as a generator with those transition probabilities. So you can go calculate these things out like that. So four by four transition matrices. Uh, the, the entropy rate, well, that's easy. It's really just two thirds of the time I'm in C. I put down the asymptotic transition state probably, no, probably C. C is seen with probably two thirds, D, probably one third. When I'm here, I have a fair coin flip, so that's two thirds of the time I see one bit of uncertainty, but if I'm in D, I'm going to see one, so that doesn't add. So I just have, just like the golden mean process, the entropy rate's two thirds per, per, per time step, and also the same statistical complexity. These two events, C and D, probably two thirds, probably one third, that's the state information. Okay, so the homework is to elaborate on the topological reconstruction here and write out the, the probabilistically distinct morphs. And as a guide, you should be getting this as the end result. It's not, not too bad. So um, you might find it handy. Um, um, sometimes uh, when I'm doing these calculations by hand, 
Uh, it's nice to have that binary tree there, the parse tree. So I have some PDFs of parse tree paper and morph paper over here. You can download and print out and try it by hand first. Just kind of saves drawing this branching tree, which if you do it by hand, is just it gets lopsided. So reference. Okay, so that's it. So these examples, just again, it's a procedure. We just go through this and we get to discover the number of states and the transition structure in, in a process. Again, starting with, it's assuming we're given the word distribution. So in any practical application, this breaks into two steps. Some statistical technique going from finite data gives you good word distribution. And once you have that, then you turn this crank to figure out how many states in the transition structure.